Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Peinecker, and you all are seeing a very familiar face. Uh, Jason Olson uh, wrote the book, The Burning Book, and he co-authored it with James Goldberg, and it's a Jewish Mormon memoir. Now, before we get there, I just wanted to announce that now we have the month of September is upon us, which means we actually have a new book giveaway for the month of September. And it's a book called A Timeline of Joseph Smith's Prophecies, His Prophecies Fulfilled by Brian Stutzman. <clears throat> Brian is actually a, a bishop at uh, in Rexburg, Idaho, uh, for uh, the single ward, young single ward. So it's all basic college students. And he's been a bishop there for the last couple of years. And he actually came down to my studio and we taped an interview about the book here and look for that interview coming up soon as well. So in the description, make sure you uh, put in... Uh, to mormonbookreviews at gmail.com and in, in the subject heading put in September book giveaway and give me your address in the email. Uh, Jason Olson, author of The Burning Book. Welcome back to the broker. I'm back by popular demand. How are you doing today? <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thanks so much for for chatting again. It's really, really a pleasure to to chat with you. So folks, this episode that we just recently released has exploded. It's performing uh, on a level that you would find from a from a channel that might be 10, 20, 30 times bigger than mine. It's been it's my second most viewed um, video of all time already. It hasn't been even out for two weeks uh, and it will be it will definitely probably be by the time this interview it, it airs will probably be my most watched video. And the reason why I had Jason come back is because, man, you guys had so many questions and comments and. Many people who are, uh, you know, believers and since, uh, who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints really felt that they had their testimonies bolstered. They really felt like it was a really wonderful interview. So we got positive. I heard from also from uh, uh, Christians who are very fascinated by this. Also, a lot of Messianic Christians who are, you know, who are fascinated by this whole thing, too, uh, because you basically you as a young boy were about to burn a Book of Mormon as, yep. an, as a Jewish boy because your, your, your Latter-day Saint friends gave it to you. And you thought, I need to burn this thing because I don't want my mom to even find it. So I got to destroy the evidence. That's how, <laughs> how taboo the Book of Mormon was to you. Yeah. And, but and as you were about to do it, you heard a voice saying, please don't burn my book. And that changes the trajectory of your, your life, right? Yeah, that's right. The, my whole life, whole, whole thing. And so what a great story. So for those of you who watched the first episode, obviously, but this is for people who have actually watched the episode and you have a ton of questions. So I just, I, I thought what we'd do is we just do a little short little episode here where we kind of cover some of the topics that have been people have brought up, some questions that people have talked about, maybe things that we didn't have a chance to talk about. I will tell you, this book is really good, very well written. It, and I think it's very well written, of course, because of your your uh, co-author, James Goldberg, is just a, an accomplished author. That was a great move because it's it's a very readable book. Uh, uh, to quote Harry Carey, the great sports podcast broadcaster, it's a very readable book. And it really is. And uh, I so one of the questions I have for you is actually my neighbor um, heard about you. Now, he's a messianic uh, Christian. OK, so so like if you drive by his house, he's got a flag of Israel hanging from his window. OK. He's, he's all, all Israel. My community is a lot of Messianic Christians that live here. And he was just fascinated by your story as I related to him. And he said, well, he says he's Jewish and he's also a Latter-day Saint. What kind of Jewish practices do you do? Uh, Do you follow the feast days? Uh, Do you, uh, any, any garb that you wear? Uh, Any, 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 what, what kind of, what do you, what do you practice the the high holy days? And what, just tell us, tell us a little bit about what does your Judaism look like? Yeah. Oh, that's a great way to frame the question, Steve. What, what, what does my Judaism look like as a, as a Latter-day Saint uh, of Jewish, uh, of Jewish extraction? you could say, um, or Hebrew extraction. Uh, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of, um, so, well, first of all, I, I do embrace, uh, the Jewish calendar. Um, and I, I, I've always honored it. I've always, uh, acknowledged it. I've never, uh, turned against it. Um, but I, uh, there's times in my life where I definitely wasn't, uh, so, uh, so observant of it, um, was tr- just trying to, to fit in. Um, I mean, one of those was my, my mission for sure. When I was, uh, 
a Latter-day Saint missionary. And, um, you know, it just, that would have been felt to me too unusual <laughs> to, um, to, to, to live in accordance with the calendar. Um, another period would have been living in Israel when the calendar of the Jewish people is the calendar of the country. <laughs> you know, the, the, the high holy days, the feasts, they are national holidays. They're not just uh, religious holidays. And I mean, they're holidays of the land itself. And then, um, but I, I mean, I guess I'll kind of start my, my journey with it. Uh, when I was serving as a, a Latter-day Saint Navy chaplain, I was also a chaplain to all religions and, and those of no religion. Um, but I was serving on a ship and uh, a cruiser and uh the nature of of serving on a ship is you you lose track of time because all you have is the, when the sun comes up and when the sun goes down and the and the stars come out and expanses of of ocean and so you 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 lose track of when it is you you become disconnected from just a human calendar. And um, that experience, uh, I served on a sh that ship for two years, and um, but probably was at sea for like nine months out of those two years. I, I started to feel I need needed more grounding. I needed to like be rooted in time. And so that's what started drawing me back to the Jewish calendar. Um, and which, which I had been around you know my whole life at least from you know birth till i graduated high school um i mean the jewish calendar was was the rhythm of life you know and and i didn't actually need a a physical calendar <laughs> i just you know my, pretty pretty much my mom you know would would tell me when it's you know when it's rosh hashanah the new year when it's yom kippur the day of atonement when it when it's passover sukkot but also going to hebrew school right we uh and, and being active in the synagogue, we, we knew when things were. Um, but uh, I had just become disconnected from that. So like I bought a, a paper, you know, hard copy Jewish calendar so that I could know when the holy days are because there's a rhythm. And, um, you know, James and I write about that in the burning book of kind of living in the rhythm of God's heartbeat is kind of how I I look at the the Jewish calendar and the the most fascinating thing for me is that the jewish calendar was a revelation um you know god is speaking to moses and saying hey here's a calendar on this day and when you go back through the five books of moses god literally says uh, on this day uh, of this month you're going to do this you're going to remember this you're going to do these ordinances or rituals and God is trying to implant a sacred rhythm into the life of his covenant people. And uh, I, I mean, I started to realize that more deeply. But um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Passover, we, we, I, I participate in a Seder, whether we have one at home or we go to one. Um, and when it comes to the Passover Seder, I know there's a lot of controversy about Christian Seders. For me, I just like to do or participate a Seder the way that it it's written in the Haggadah, just the tradition. Um, I don't try to try to twist it around. Um, for me, you know, a miracle happened. Uh, the my my own ancestors were delivered from Egypt miraculously by the hand of God supernaturally in my in my belief and I need to recognize that I need to honor that I need to do the revealed uh, rituals and Seder that uh, that came out of that to remember that properly um, because it's for me it's showing thanks to God for something that he did for my ancestors you know and, and so yeah I've got every once in a while get criticism from Latter-day Saints, you know, that's all done away. It's uh, now we have the sacrament, the, you know, the, the bread and the water and the, the body and blood of sim symbolic of the body and blood of Christ. Why do you still do that? They say, well, why do you 
celebrate Pioneer Day. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, because I want to recognize my my ancestors who, you know, went from Nauvoo, Illinois and went on an uh, exodus, <laughs> went on an exodus to Utah. Yep. Said, okay, well, why would I, you know, why would I not recognize um, three thousand years ago when my ancestors had their exodus? And yep. they said, oh, well, you have. Wh why would I not take an opportunity to to thank God for what He's done for my fathers and mothers? Uh, it's even, you know, it's in the Book of Mormon, um, in you know the the famous uh, Mor Moroni chapter ten. So. Um, so that's kind of how I approach them, and because these are my ancestors, and uh, you know, we even have some some jabby uh, things in the book in the burning book of, you know, the, as Latter Day Saints, we believe in the spirit of Elijah, that you're to turn your hearts to your fathers, and uh, you're also your your fathers and mothers will turn their hearts to you as the descendants. This the the binding, um, the grafting of of generations so if if i'm going to turn my heart to my ancestors uh who are, are jewish on my mother's side uh then i'm going to want to you know live the kind of life that they lived i'm going to want to try to re preserve that because it's it's special uh it's revealed so the jewish holy days are are right in line with that and we you know we we light a a, a shabbat candle on friday night um, so I've I've got a whole store of Shabbat candles and and I uh, and then I usually uh, will read from that week's Torah portion with my 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 wife and kids because I I want to honor that tradition of this Shabbat is this Torah portion. It's just it's so simple, but it's one of the the beautiful things of Judaism. And now I guess I'm kind of you know geeking on Judaism a little bit and uh, the, but um. You know that you've got the five books of Moses. That's the core scripture of the Jewish people, the five books of Moses, and and this wonderful um, kind of tradition that you know reading a portion of the five books of Moses that all Jews all around the world are reading that same portion every Shabbat, and I want to stay connected to that. Yes, I've adopted the Book of Mormon. And you, Steve, and and those and viewers know that I've adopted the Book of Mormon, but I still feel like the Torah, the five books of Moses, is still actually like my central scripture, my covenant scripture. Right, right. And so I, I really want to stay connected to it. I, I feel tremendous meaning um, okay. from the Torah portion. But yeah, you, said, and you, you actually said yeah. the Book of Mormon is like a supplement to the Torah. Is yeah. That how you describe it? Yeah. So I think that's a fascinating way of looking at it. Now, I, I do want to ask you, uh, first of all, folks, we're actually going to talk a little bit about Joseph Smith uh, as well. I think that's a, you, that was an area that you wanted to have a conversation with. But I wanted to ask a few more questions about what yeah. does your Judaism look like as a Latter-day Saint? And one of those questions I have for you is, so, so basically you do, you, you, so you do uh, on Shabbat, uh, you light a candle and you do the Torah portion. Do you uh, practice a kosher? Um, I, I do my very best, actually. Okay. Yeah. And there's a there's a good story of that. Um and I don't e I don't even know if it's in the burning book, so maybe you're maybe you're getting exclusive a exclusive content to the burning book. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, I mean when I was when I was a missionary, I uh, look, we were we were in New Jersey. Yeah. Jersey City. We're uh, I like to say um and I, I talked to a really good Jewish buddy from one of my best buddies from high school about this and i i mean all, all these little cities on my mission were on the the west side of the uh or the west bank of the hudson river <laughs> and, uh, and right right across from like uh, right across from manhattan um and i i didn't my mission didn't cover manhattan but it was all these uh, on the west bank of the hudson river in new jersey and um in, in any case we we yeah we had a lot of jewish people uh on my mission, which, you know, there's many fascinating stories about my encounters with, with them, but also we had people from literally all over the world. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's, Im it's immigrant land. And so there's a lot of cuisines and, you know, and I mean, that's kind of the, one of the reasons I understand the, uh, the Peter revelation of, uh, you know, this kind of banquet, this picnic, 
uh, blanket with, with all kinds of unclean, unkosher foods and rise up, slay and eat. Um, you know, because Peter is going to have to go into the world and he's going to have to go into other nations. Um, so anyway, our chapters, right, unto all nations in New Jersey. <laughs> this this, uh, this interesting idea of my mission, I mean, literally all the nationalities of the whole world. And that includes their cuisines. And so I, I couldn't be uh, too picky to try to, to keep kosher or something. Um, although... The home I was raised in was not a kosher home anyway, so um, it wasn't like there was a huge transition um, going on my mission. But um, once I got married to, you know, my dear bride, Sarah, you know, I hadn't even thought through all these questions. Um, I had lived in Israel for a time where things are kosher automatically, right? It's just it's the national cuisine is is kosher um and and restaurants have to you know usually have to or they, they they can have a wider business if they have a kosher kitchen so you did you know um but i had just kind of like gotten back from israel and i and i was at brigham young university and i hadn't thought through all these things and we were going to eat uh shrimp for for <laughs> for dinner one night and um my poor wife bless her heart bless her heart. She, she had made the shrimp dinner and something came over me and I felt, I just can't, I can't do it. I can't, I can't eat this shrimp dinner. And I, and she had already made it. She was really, she was really mad. <laughs> and, and, uh, but I just, I just felt like conscientiously, I can't, I can't do it. I'm so sorry. Like I, I can't, um, and, you know, we were trying to explore, you know, why, you know, do you feel it's a commandment? Do you do doing this to honor your ancestors? Uh, are you just, are you trying to imitate Jesus? Because uh, Jesus kept, kept kosher. So, I mean, if Jesus kept kosher, how is that a sin? Which, you know, the, the complications of how the Torah, the law of Moses actually became sin. Um, there's, there's, that's a very complicated topic, but um uh but in any case i it, 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 i think it's a combination of all those things and i just um i vote even as a as a young jewish boy right i felt very connected to the torah and the i felt that these commandments these mitzvahs are revelations um for in, guidance for life and i i mean i so i started i have started having to grapple with that so anyway i've uh, long story i i uh i started to uh begin to like av definitely avoid uh, pork and shellfish and i've always maintained that but um as best as i can uh and, and uh i mean but you know it's not like we we have like a, a fully orthodox kitchen or something with um with separate milk and meat or or, or anything like that but i i try to you know, I try to honor the 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 so commandments as I. You can eat a cheeseburger. Do you do you eat cheeseburgers? I I don't eat cheeseburgers. I okay. I, I I try I try not to mix milk and meat. Okay. Uh, just just out of I mean I don't think I'm gonna be uh you know hugely condemned by God for for something like that. But I'm just trying to I'm just trying to honor the revelation, right? Um, Moses got a revelation and I, I think, you know, if God took the time to, to give these commandments to Moses, then I should, I should take them seriously. And I mean, that's just how I feel. I don't, I don't know if that's a Jewish part of me, uh, addressing that or a Latter-day Saint part of me addressing that, but, um, uh, you know, there's, there, you know, there's this interesting, uh, tradition, right? Uh, Latter-day Saints view, when they understand Adam and Eve, you know, that, you know, that Adam was, uh, you know, when, when Eve brings the fruit, you know, the forbidden fruit, um, you know, Adam has this, uh, I mean, we obviously have this expansive view of Eve that, you know, she, she understands the bigger picture that, um, that the forbidden fruit enables them to have children and to, you know, to, have 
have bodies for the the children of of God. Um, but but Adam, his kind of understanding is, you know, he wants to keep all of God's commandments, right? And so God had said, you know, said, don't eat this fruit. So Adam was just like, okay, you know, he's not trying to, he's not trying to dig into it or see a mystery. He's just, if God, if God commanded it, I'm going to try to do it. So, um, I, I feel, I feel some resonance with that. I just, uh, you know, if I, if I can keep a commandment, I'm, I'm going to try. Do I fail? Yeah. But, but I, I feel, um, I feel, uh, attracted to, to keeping the commandments, um, or driven to. So that's just kind of my nature, I guess, my, my okay. orthodox nature. <laughs> so is there just real quick before we move on to another other subjects, uh, what other, uh, Jewish practices, uh, do you, do you do? And then are you, and then are like, for instance, do your, do you, do you have your, does your family practice kosher or do your, do your kids eat cheeseburgers or, well, I mean, just to kind of, kind of tell me what this means, like as, as a, a you know, a, 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 in your, within the familial context and any other Jewish practices you might be engaging in as well. Yeah. My, my wife and kids generally, generally, uh, eat whatever they want. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we don't, you know, usually have any like pork or shellfish in the home because, okay. I guess I eat the most, so. <laughs> yeah. um, but the, you know, certainly they're 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 not thinking in those terms, and okay. Uh, so you're yeah, raising your kids, you're raising your kids to be Latter Day Saints, but you are a practicing Jew who is also a Latter Day Saint. Is that a way of looking at it? Well, I mean, I, yeah, I would say, yeah, it's kind of, and I actually talked through this with with James when we were when we were writing, and how do we deal with this? I think there's. The way I look at it, there's who you are and what you believe. <laughs> yeah. And I, I try to look at them as two separate things. And that, that might be very offensive to people. But um, so when, he, when, I talk, when I think about who, who, who I am, my identity, I still think of myself very much as a Jewish person um, because it's, it's who I am, where I, where I come from, right? My ancestors, my... Uh, but then what do I believe? Well, I, I've definitely embraced the Book of Mormon. I've embraced the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But um, I am I would say I acknowledge that there can be friction or, uh, yeah, there, there, there can be uh, some dissonance but, or, yeah, or, or competition uh, between the, the, the two. Um, who you are, what you believe, okay. and and I'm I've become okay with that. I be I'm I'm at peace with that. Um, I don't, I'm I don't I'm not trying to fit into like a neat a neat box because then uh, it's 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 not a good not a good path <laughs> so, <laughs> for me. You know, what, what's so fat? One of the more interesting facets of your book, your story, is that you um, engaged Messianic Jews or Messianic Christians, whatever you want to call them. And they kind of, and the rabbi um, basically threw you and your companion out of the group that they didn't want you interacting. I just have a few questions. Um, first of all, if you're a Messianic Christian or Jew, and you have this Jewish boy who's about to burn the Book of Mormon, he hears a voice not to burn the Book of Mormon, don't burn my book. And then he has a testimony that Jesus is, is the Messiah as a Jewish boy by reading the Book of Mormon. Um, the question I pose to you Messianic Christians is, what do you make of that? Because I think that's a fascinating story. But I also want to ask you about, there's a lot of, Jew, I, I noticed there's a lot of Latter-day Saints. And I, and this, I didn't prepare you for this question. So if I'm catching you off guard, don't, don't be, you know, just going to, but there's a lot, I noticed a lot of Latter-day Saints do like read uh, Jonathan Kahn, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, um, and also, also Michael Rood, another Messianic uh, a Christian guy. There's a lot of them that actually have kind of, followed these people. Jonathan Kahn was based in New Jersey. Did you ever have any interactions with him or his group? Was that part of your mission? I'm just curious. And what do you make of these uh, messianic groups in general? Uh, how, you know, because of course they don't, they pushed you out. They don't really care for you they don't, because you're kind of like me, a unicorn. They don't know what to figure out how to handle something <laughs> with you. Uh, but what are your, what's your general views about like people like Michael Reed ah. and Jonathan Kahn? 
Yeah, no, that's that's great, Steve. Well, I, I, I first have to clarify, I think, to, to just give the benefit of the doubt to the Messianic Jewish congregation in uh, New York that I participated with. I think I think one of the reasons I, I was also like a, a literally a, a card wearing missionary at the time. <laughs> and, you know, I, so my I mean, my identity at the time was a missionary of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I don't think they perceive me as a potential brother in that way. Um, I think in other contexts, right? I mean, when I was a Latter-day Saint Navy chaplain, right? And I, I mean, I was a commissioned chaplain. I was endorsed by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but I didn't have a, a missionary identity. Um, I, I remember a, a fellow chaplain taking me to a, a Messianic Jewish congregation in North Carolina and um, where I was serving with Marines. And they were extremely welcoming and extremely open. And, you know, they knew my my background as a Latter Day Saint with also Jewish, Jew, a Jewish heritage. And and they were they were welcoming. They they were like, you could you know you can come here as much as you want. You know, you're 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 welcome. You're a brother, kind of right. So um, I I don't want to paint all. Uh, messianic jewish congregations just by that one experience that that was an experience interesting story and i think the dynamics between the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints and messianic judaism and then my kind of my purpose as a missionary but um uh i i think uh yeah i think well as i as i kind of zoom out i will have to say that you know, it's the, the the religious freedom aspect of America that allows for the development of something like Messianic Judaism. Um, you know, I, uh, uh, th this idea that you know America is almost in in some ways a religious in the religious domain is kind of an anarchy. <laughs> people people can uh, can develop religions any kind of religion. So. Um, you know, with Messianic Judaism, it's uh, it it could it could only really truly be born in America, but it's also developing in in Israel as well. Um, and and I think that the questions that Messianic Jews and and their rabbis are are dealing with are are fascinating. Um, and I mean, I'm I'm in touch with with Messianic Jews and. And uh, more with like scholars um, that are, that they have you know have an academic society and I, I mean some of them are also clergy in that way um, and we've had very rich conversations I think uh, I mean I think there's some boundaries where I've embraced the Book of Mormon and that's too a little too far for them um, but they're dealing with some very complex questions and, and in their own way trying to restore this uh, original Jewish community that was following Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, and I mean, I think, I mean, now if we get wax a little historical, right, you have, you know, James the Just, the brother of Jesus, uh, based out of Jerusalem, that from what we have in scriptural sources and historical sources seems to be very messianically jewish i mean he's still connected to the temple he's still connected to the jewish calendar to kosher um to, to covenant to circumcision i mean even you know even paul talks about the gospel to the circumcision well that was given unto james and peter you know and the gospel uncircumcision given to paul and so i think we are we, we can already see that there was kind of a jewish community and a, a gentile community and Messianic Jews have been, you know, I think trying to recover, recover what they can learn from that and, and try to live in that way. Um, and I, I think that's a beautiful thing. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, and there's, they're, they're, they're using the scriptures, the New Testament um, and, and, the, uh, and the, the Hebrew Bible, but they're also, I've seen them try to work with Jewish t sources as well, you know, Talmud and Mishnah. I mean, and they're wrestling. Look, I mean, 
if you're wrestling with scripture, you're wrestling with God. I'm all for it. Okay, I love that. Uh, how, That's a great way to look at it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, it's really, what's so fascinating to me is, so I, I live in a cr Christian community. We've had this place since the 80s. And since the 80s, this Christian community every year does a Feast of Tabernacles. Ah. So later this month, that it's one of their big, big events. People come from all over the country, all over the world to come to the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, one in every year, uh, Paul Wilbur, who's a pretty famous uh, musician, and Jonathan Kahn will be he comes every year to this as well. Um, I'm I, I want to go back to uh, just these characters. Are you familiar with Jonathan Kahn and or Michael Rood? They're kind of leaders within the Messianic world, and also there's a lot of overlap within the the Mormon world as well. Or latter day, yeah, stories. yeah, and, um, a little familiar with them. I ha yeah, I mean, there's some, some others that I I think are that I'm uh, like Rabbi Jason Sobel that I, that I'm more a little more familiar with that consults for the chosen. I th I mean, I think the chosen is is uh, has a very strong Messianic Jewish uh, influence in okay. it, which okay. which which I which I love, which I um. And I mean, we could also talk about right the tension between the normative Jewish community and the Messianic Jewish community, and that's you know that's also something I'm very sensitive of, um, yeah. and uh, you know, and I mean, so the 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 idea of the completed Jew, right? Right. Or, yeah. I that that's why you know, and James and I talked through this. That's why I need it's so so important to have like a a beautiful soul as a as a co-author to try to figure these things out because we were James and I were working on questions that Latter-day Saints have never asked in the history right. of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yeah. We, and so we had to figure out how we're going to write about it. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and, and so, yeah, so on, on that, uh, on that question, um, uh, well, actually, I forgot where I was going with that. Well, but... <laughs> well, uh, so yeah, the, the, the completed Jew is a problematic. Completed term. Jew. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, so we... I will never use that term because I, I do think it's a slap in the face of the, the Jewish people. Um, I think after, yes. especially after 2000 years of history of persecution and the and done in the name of Christ to these people, I'm never, ever going to try to define their religion for them or tell them that they're not properly following their religion because I'm sorry, that's just. I ain't going there, man, you know, because that just leads to a lot yeah. of bad things. <laughs> and so that's, and, that's uh, yeah. where we got to be careful with those tensions, too. And that's that's why I mm -hmm. I don't use that term. I don't I will not define myself as a completed Jew. I, I, I would say I'm I'm a Jew in in conflict. I'm a Jew in uh, or I'm uh, I'm compromised. I think that, okay. you know, as, as James yeah. and I kind of dialogue with it, we're like, well, how, how are we going to do this? Because there's right. so much friction between. Judaism and Messianic Judaism. Yes. So, so we kind of settled on this compromised Jew. <laughs> okay. And the way that to unpack that, if if you want, is right. I mean, and we we kind of dealt with it in the the other episode, but um, touched on it. But you know, I was given the Sinai Covenant, right? I mean, I was born into the Sinai Covenant with all of its obligations, with a very clear contour of what the Jewish people is. Right there's these commandments, 613, uh, more than half of them you cannot do uh, outside the land of Israel. So there's, the, I mean, the performance is in the land of Israel, um, and there's it's a people with uh, prophets, priests, and kings, and an identity that's formed as a people, as a nation. I mean that's that's being a Jew, and so if I go and I I embrace what what I perceive as a, another or a a branch or I mean that you could look at in different ways of uh, of a covenant, Camorra covenant um, that that kind of flows through the Book of Mormon. Um, you know that in, in some ways that makes me compromised, right? Um, because now I've got a Sinai covenant and a Camorra covenant, and I'm right. I'm not truly faithful to the Sinai covenant. Um, but am I still a Jew? Well, yeah, I mean, according to Halakha, uh, to Torah's the Jewish law. My mother's Jewish, so I'm still Jewish, and even, even if I'm 
a heretic or an apostate or however <laughs> folks can define there's uh, you know two jews three opinions mm -hmm. um but but uh but i can i can also feel that i'm not being totally faithful to the jewish people and uh because i'm not fully participating in the sinai covenant now i honor it and i i i see it there and i try to participate in it but i'm not i'm not fully participating in that revelation community um and so i so i i can't uh uh but I, I'm wrestling. Maybe that's even sure. a better word. Is yeah. is I, I'm 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 a, I'm still wrestling. You're res a wrestling Jew, which is I <laughs> think the most appropriate thing to be in many ways. It's really foundational to your faith to wrestle with God, and yeah. to question and to be in dialogue all the time, and never quite feeling comfortable with all the you know you want to keep on prodding and you want to keep on asking these questions. And I think it's a very Jewish thing, which is what I love about the, the Jewish people. You know, just go just kind of doubling back to what you because people picked up on this in our last interview was the idea of this covenant made at Sinai that all the Jewish souls were present there. So yeah. in one sense people picked up on this rule fast pre-existence. That's a yeah. normal doctrine. So is is the idea of pre-existence uh, uh, a, a mainstream is that part of Judaism? Do you think that Judaism there's, or at least it, it hints at it? There's oh a, yeah, okay. Well, it, it's not it's not a it's not a Latter Day Saint doctrine. It was first a first a Jewish doctrine before it was. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a more mystical idea, but there's absolutely uh, Jewish sources. Um, I, I mean, the the concept I, I'm I believe is called the world of souls, and so. That this idea, I mean, even when I studied with Rabbi Raphael that we talked about, I would ask him about this all the time because I was just, I wanted to know. And, you know, e even in the Garden of Eden, there is a tradition, a very strong tradition that, uh, and it, it's a tradition that in Adam, uh, especially when Adam was in the Garden of Eden, an idea called Adam Kadmon, the first Adam kind of. Um, and there's a lot of variations and interpretations, but this idea that like within Adam, Adam uh, was all the human souls that would ever come into the world. And so like kind of when, when the fall happened, that allowed this process of all the all these stole, souls that were in the, the, the this Adam Kadmon to kind of be uh, to get their own separate bodies. Um kind of a you know a storehouse uh, of souls and certainly that you know certain souls were kind of designated to be Israel or or Jewish and uh, to make that Sinai covenant uh, kind of a foreordination um, and I mean this also parallels in the book of Abraham where you know um, the noble and great ones that were kind of near the throne of God, in the pre-mortal world and you know abraham thou art one of them thou art one of the noble and great ones there's this that, that's in latter-day saint scripture but there's there's definitely this confluence um and uh of uh i mean i mean judaism and and La the church of jesus christ latter-day saints going go a little you know maybe a little different directions in it but the concept is there that there's kind of a covenantal pre pre-mortality Okay. Um, well, this is so fascinating to me because, of course, now let's let's switch over to Joseph Smith, because Joseph Smith was schooled by a rabbi at the uh, at the Kirtland Temple uh, to learn Hebrew, and 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 I and, and and the question I have for you is this: this would be like okay, the influence is on Joseph Smith. First of all, he hears that Elohim is a plural, uh, and that's where they think the idea was seeded that there would be. Um, you know, multiple gods, you know, like, you know, like, you know, that there could be within, within that term when he would had it explained to him by this Jewish rabbi. But also, would Joseph Smith been, been uh, would th these ideas been brought to him about like pre-existence in these stories? Could, could was, was Joseph borrowing from the Jewish tradition, do you believe? Or uh, in, in addition to maybe he's also receiving revelation, but he's also, because he's engaged, he engaged a rabbi, he engaged Judaism and Jewish writings, well, kind of tell me what you're at, at from the unique perspective you're at. Who Joseph Smith and that 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 confluence going on with Judaism? Yeah, I mean this is this is underexplored. Um, um, he 
I mean, first to, to talk about Joshua Sages. Yes. Joshua Sages is was Joseph Smith's Hebrew tutor right. and uh, signed his kind of graduation certificate um, and, and gave him the highest marks for his dedication and, and competence in Hebrew study. I mean, and Joseph Smith was kind of going through a process that that uh, other religious Christian religious leaders would have gone if they could get into, you know, to Harvard or Princeton or Yale, right, where they, they would have studied, right, Hebrew and Greek. <laughs> it's just Joseph Smith was, he was obviously on a, on a different trajectory, and he wasn't go, going to divinity schools to do these things, but he was going through a process of developing himself, I think, as a religious leader. So I, it only makes sense that he'd want to learn Hebrew, but he's also deeply, but what's his choice? His choice of, of a Hebrew teacher is, uh, the son of one of the great kind of colonial rabbis, uh, Gershom Sages. Um, and I've actually been to that synagogue. Um, the, it's the, the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in Manhattan uh, on the Upper West Side, and um, which was founded by Gershom Sages, the, the rabbi, uh, and Joshua Sages is his son. Oh. So th 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 and this is the first synagogue in the United States. Uh yeah. This, so, so, so the 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 Hebrew teacher of Joseph Smith is what was part of the first Jewish congregation uh, in America. Um, so, I mean, yeah, yeah, pretty, uh, I mean, pretty if wild. I, if I was a believing Latter Day Saint, I would find a lot of significance in that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's a tie there, right? Um, Almost a providential. And, how how does the the son of one of the most prominent Jewish rabbis make his way into rural Ohio and engage this? this uneducated farm boy and, 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 and schools him, it would be almost, I would think as a Latter-day Saint, it would almost have to be a providential occurrence. Absolutely. I, I believe so. I mean, personally, I, I believe that, that Joseph Smith was trying to restore Israel. I mean, that's, and, and there's been some other great writing about this, you know, Patrick Mason. And I don't know if you've got his, his book about, the restoration. And, um, I mean, for those who follow like Avraham Gileadi, he's very, mm -hmm. very tight on this of the restoration of natural Israel. So, I mean, there, so Joseph Smith's kind of early attraction to, to real Jewish people is, is, is a thing, <laughs> you know, I mean, he's, he's wanting, he's feeling part of the restoration is to, to learn from the Jewish people and Judaism he says very positive things about Judaism. The, I think the most positive of any of his contemporaries. I mean, he he there's a, a divine. He calls it attendance on divine um, incul on uh, on divine inculcation, which is kind of a strange phrase, but that, that that's a quote from Joseph Smith. Judaism is an attendance on divine inculcation and uh, real piety. These are. Uh, from the times and seasons. So, I mean, Joseph Smith has this deep respect for Judaism and he, he wants to learn from it. Um, right. We have revelation and we have tradition. And, you know, and I think uh, the role of a prophet is, is to embrace both and to wrestle with both. You know, it's not revelation only um, tradition in my view is uh, received revelation or, or passed down revelation, right? And so if a revelation happened on Mount Sinai, which I'm certain it did, you know, I'm in that way a believing Jew in that way. <laughs> um, and, and, and Moses had this incredible revelation, which is also attested in the book of Moses, a, a Latter-day Saint scripture, that Moses like received everything. Well, if, if Judaism has, but through the process of tradition, passed down that revelation, I, I would imagine that a, the, the prophet of a, of a restoration would want to tap into that and see what he can learn from that tradition, um, which would, would, could enhance some of the, the basic or um, the raw revelations that he's receiving, you know, in, in the early 19th century. And um, so I, I think you, you, you maybe there's some beautiful syntheses, syntheses happening. Harold Bloom in the American religion. I don't know if you've read that. Oh, I mean, yeah. He's, Joseph he's Smith is Metatron. 
Well, right? <laughs> I, that's I, what Harold I, says. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, I don't, I don't know about that. I didn't know that that quote, but uh, yeah. but he. I mean, yeah. I mean, he's Harold Bloom was you know a real fan of the Kabbalah and yep. and he's seeing a lot of connections between Joseph Smith and and Jewish mysticism. And he, I mean, you know, he calls Joseph Smith a religious genius. Yes. Um, As I, see, I, I love, yeah. I love the, uh, that the, 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 the audacity of Howard uh, Bloom in engaging Joseph Smith within a Jewish context. Yeah. And how, how he was praised him so effusively that I honestly, I, I kind of forget about my engaging with Joseph Smith. I tell people, you know, I kind of, Fell in love with Joseph Smith in many ways by reading Rough Stone Rolling, by really knowing yeah. my, knows my history in one sense. This is a very complicated, nuanced thing, of course, from my perspective. Yeah. But I have, I'm starting to wonder now, I kind of forget about Harold Bloom's book where he talks about Joseph. And really, in one sense, yeah. And you got to look up that paper. Look it up. Google it. Uh, Harold Bloom, Joseph Smith is Metatron. He wrote a whole paper saying that Joseph Smith oh. is Metatron. Okay. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So 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 this that okay. he took it that that far, dude. He wow. You know, I mean, he basically made Joseph okay. into a divine character. So so to me, that's 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 what makes the this interaction, this conversation that Judaism is having with the Restoration, the fact that we have this, but then we have this complex relationship too, because at the same time, we don't have a Hebrew edition of the Book of Mormon. Why? Because of the agreement that they made with the Israeli government in order to build the Jerusalem Center, the BYU Jerusalem Center, they agreed not to do any proselytizing, nor yeah. would they publish a Hebrew Book of Mormon. So maybe just talk a little bit about that, because that's also another fascinating, fascinating overlap. Wow. And the only church, the only church that has actually agreed with the, they have an official agreement with the government of Israel not to proselytize. It's a very unique story. Wow, Steve, I, I'm really impressed. I'm really impressed. You, you know, uh, you know things that are well beyond the knowledge of of many many a Latter Day Saint. So that's kola kavod, <laughs> which we would say in Hebrew. You know, all all the glory to you. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, it's like a yeah, it's like a, a Hebrew uh, kola kavod. Um, yeah, I, uh, th so there there is a Hebrew Book of Mormon that exists, but it's it's been totally discontinued. Um, and when I was a, I mean, I, I always love telling stories, but when I was a student at Brigham Young University, uh, we had this amazing, um, modern Israeli Hebrew teacher. Oh, uh, you okay? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm grabbing a book of Mormon for you real quick. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, just to keep talking. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we had this amazing Hebrew teacher, Monica is her name, um, and and you know, my shout out to Monica. Um, she was she was a great teacher and friend, um, but she was able to get us as Hebrew students at Brigham Young University um, some printed, like specially printed copies of the he the Book of Mormon in Hebrew, you know, li limited edition, and um, you know, because we're Hebrew students, so we, we, we you know we want to study it um but yeah as part of the there's a, a fascinating history that, that in some ways the church was ramping up and it was it was working on this hebrew book of mormon and there was elder legrand richards was his name of the quorum mm -hmm. of the 12 apostles and he was working with um this famous latter-day saint named rosemary reed and she developed uh swimsuits for women and was very famous based out of Los Angeles. And um, and they were these kind of two collaborated, colluded to, you know, try to do more missionary work amongst Jewish people. And um, but during that time, the, the church was also negotiating with the Israeli government to uh, to broker the Brigham Young University Jerusalem Center. So there was, you know, there's these two. Mm -hmm. uh, impulses that were happening at the same time uh, around the same time uh, I'd, I'd have to go back and check the dates but um ultimately the uh the, the brigham young U jerusalem university jerusalem center won out and and that's when they they put the cap and put the pause on uh, the book of mormon hebrew publishing and, and discontinued it 
and you know just stopped it in its tracks because they you know they're wanting to build trust with with the Israeli government with the Jewish people you know we're you can't if you've promised not to proselytize then you can't you can't just keep printing Hebrew copies of the Book of Mormon right I mean that's it's not having integrity so I, I mean I guess I would if, if I kind of zoom out I look at it as this example of integrity that the that the church the leaders of the church the first presidency quorum of the 12 or uh, apostles are, are are wanting to keep trust and 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 they 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 demonstrated integrity with with Israel with the Jewish people um you know for me that would be nice to have more copies of the book of mormon in hebrew or be able to get like a nice one or something and not like a, a spiral bound right uh, which is one that i got but um well, but I'm grateful that, that 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 the leaders of the church have. I mean, they they really have absolute integrity. So, well, I, I will talk to you off camera about this because I'm actually um, I'm knowledgeable of a group that is in the process of translating the Book of Mormon into Hebrew, and it's supposed to it's going to be a really excellent one. But I I wanted to ask you: Do you have a copy of this edition of the Book of Mormon, the Stick of Joseph in the Hand of Ephraim? Um, I've heard a, of it. Yeah, I've heard, I don't have a copy, but I've I've heard of it. Yeah. So it's a, it's kind of a it's kind of a uh, a Yiddish version of the Book of Mormon, so it's written, oh. written in English, but it has a, a and, and also like for instance, originally translated by Yosef Ben Yosef. Uh, so they okay. use uh, uh, Jewish terms. Uh, some of our uh, okay, then the, then the the Book of Mormon names like Moshaya, Enosh, uh, Yahram, uh, Shalomin, uh, Kelamin, or whatever. Um, uh, so oh. they so they have so they have the the names of the books also in jewish and and so and then also the names in the book of mormon are made into jewish names so it's really fascinating so um it's it's a it's a it's a it's a it, and i got this sent to me this is uh this is just so you know this is affiliated with the group that uh, is affiliated with uh, denver snuffer um okay so, so that's 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 that one which is really fascinating but so there are other groups out there that are making attempts uh, to translate the Book of Mormon into Hebrew because they don't have those agreements with the Israeli government because these are in restoration branches that are outside of the purview of the of, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. So yeah. I, so so what's going to be interesting because again this is the thing the the Book of Mormon makes it very clear who the intended audience is, and it is for the it Jewish does, people. and so in one sense if, in order for the Book of Mormon to be fully fulfilled, it almost. It, it almost is required that at some point a Hebrew edition of the Book of Mormon has to come forth in one sense, wouldn't you say? Yes. Um, it, the, the Book of Mormon was, was written by uh, Hebrew, Hebrew speakers. <laughs> I mean, at least in the first couple generations, right? Right. I mean, even, even Moroni says that if our plates would have been uh, sufficiently large we we would have written in hebrew and there you would find no imperfection in our record um i i think there's this desire of the book of mormon prophets and writers to to write in hebrew um and they they do view it as a pure language um i mean there there's a, a hebrew philia <laughs> in the book of mormon there's no doubt and there's a Judeophilia in the Book of Mormon. It's 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 an attractive book. I, I talked talked about this with a Jewish Latter Day Saint convert friend. You know, I mean, uh, I mean the Jewish people wrote the Book of Mormon. So if I take off my kind of my uh, deeply embedded devotional hat, right? I mean, it's it's I view the Book of Mormon as our cultural artifact. <laughs> yeah you know i'm ah. I, am i am i grateful to joseph smith for recovering it and translating it by the by the power of god a absolutely but it you know it's it's my claim right um it, lehi yes okay lehi was from the tribe of ephraim but uh, if you look at it from the scholarly lens he's a jew because the jewish people are the people who survived um the assyrian invasion of jerusalem during the the reign of hezekiah right that you've got the jews under siege kind of a an armageddon pattern right the jews are under siege hezekiah is the king he's righteous you got isaiah um 
right? And and they're miraculously delivered with 185,000, right? Assyrian soldiers are um, are just wiped out by an angel. And then, I mean, that that delivered community becomes the Jewish people of of whatever tribes they they you know they're from all kinds of different tribes. It's not obviously the, the Jewish people idea is 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 not uh, discriminating against tribes. It's that's not what it's about. It's about Judah, those people that were redeemed, uh, deli- you know, delivered in Judea in Jerusalem. Um, so Lehi clearly comes from there. <laughs> I mean, right? Sure. He leaves before the Babylonian exile. So, so Lehi, Nephi, Laman, Lem- they're all Jews, um, and they wrote this record. They wanted to write it in Hebrew. They they practice Torah. Um, that's why right, we've talked about the the transition. Right. But it's uh, in that sense, uh, it's yeah, it's 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 my it's a cultural artifact of my people, and okay. um, okay. so yeah, well, I mean, in that sense, other, uh, with, yeah. within Ju- within Judaism, it's believed that the pure language is 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 Hebrew, right? Like that's absolutely the, okay. So then it, it begs the question because the Book of Mormon also tells us that there is a group of people that were allowed to keep the Adamic language, and that would have been the Jaredites. So if the Jaredites okay. would, would have probably then would have had the Adamic language, which I'm assuming is the, is pure Hebrew. And so 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 now we so would, so would you agree that the, the book of Ether is would, would have been written in Hebrew? I don't know. That's a good question. And what's so I, fascinating I, I, I would, is that I would like to assume so. <laughs> so we're using, but see, this also can also talks about how the corruption. Let's just let's just say, okay, because it, it to me it's implied that if we have a, a base language, a pure language, an Adamic language, which within Judaism would have been Hebrew, and that the Jaredites were able to maintain their language, right? They 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 went during the scattering, right? And then 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 they come across the records, their records, and they're translating them. What seems interesting to me is it seems at this point then that by the time of King Benjamin's Benjamin's time or uh yeah that that they have kind of lost their Hebrew the ability to read Hebrew so they needed translators to then to to uh translate the book of ether so it almost tells us that we 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 can maybe say that the early like the you know the orig- the early stuff was written in Hebrew and then and then somehow reformed Egyptian gets into here kind of corrupt and maybe the language gets corrupt and then they're encountering the pure language i'm just Totally spitball in here, but what what do you how do you respond to that? I I think it's it's all very possible. <clears throat> one one of the I I'll tell you a story of the Urim and Thummim. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, when I was a teenager, and I, this is also not in the burning book. I don't, I don't think this is in the burning book. Um, so this is you know more Steve uh, exclusive content, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was reading about the Joseph Smith story and, um, and about how he got and recovered the Urim and Thummim from the, the cave. Um, and, and I was curious, I, you know, I, I kind of barely heard about the Urim and Thummim from like a Torah portion, you know, Urim Vatumim, lights and perfections is kind of the, the Hebrew translation, but, you know, stones and, so in any case, at the time, uh, the Rabbi Raphael, he gave me these books by Rabbi Arya Kaplan. And Rabbi Arya Kaplan was this very, very in- incredible, uh, I-, I mean, just mind-blowing Orthodox rabbi, uh, a scholar beyond, really beyond belief. I, I mean, I think, uh, and a scholar also of Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, and I mean, just a master if you look, yeah, if you look up Arya Kaplan, just incredible. You 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 would you would love it, Steve, if you get some of his stuff. But he has this two-volume handbook of Jewish thought. I've always been into that. Um, and so I look up Urim and Thummim, Urim Vatumim, in uh Arya Kaplan's handbook of Jewish thought, and then I I read about how it actually worked. And this this is also pulling from Talmud, right? Because you can't. I mean, the Urim and Thummim is just barely mentioned in the in the Torah, the, in the written Torah, right? So you need the Talmud to kind of understand more. And and he writes about it, and he he talks about you know the 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 rabbis of the Mishnah and Talmud. They explain that the the high priest had a breastplate, and then the breastplate had twelve stones, 
and each stone had in Hebrew letters uh, written the name of each of the 12 tribes of Israel, you know, forming, I think, most of the Hebrew alphabet uh, on this breastplate. And then inside the breastplate was the Urim and Thummim, the two stones. Um, and, and and obviously Latter-day Saint tradition has a you know, huge place for these. But the high priest would go, I mean, Rabbi Arya Kaplan, the high priest would go before God with the breastplate, lay it out, and ask God what, whatever he needs to ask on behalf of the, the collective house of Israel. And the, and the Urim and Thummim would light and shine um, kind of like on a, on a parchment, it says, or kind of like a, a projection almost, like maybe kind of like a divine hologram of the these letters these hebrew letters uh so that you could you know th these hebrew letters would shine through uh the breastplate and you could you know you could start spelling out um the the revelation god's word um so you know i mean as far as that process which was preserved within judaism I, I'm I'm open to the idea of you know that that some some kind of similar process occurring in the Book of Mormon, um, and with the Jaredite record, you know they they did you know they needed um, the tra the the translation stones or or whatnot to uh, to deal with that. So um, I mean that's I mean, the Book of Mormon is very clear that Urim and Thummim is the uh, prerogative of a seer, and so. I, I I don't know I can't get I I can't understand necessarily all the specifics but I'm 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 very much uh, supportive of the you know that there's tools available to mm -hmm. to deal with all these languages and I mean even in Jewish tradition that dealing with with revelation and languages and and letters uh, was already there so uh, there's a space open for Urim and Thummim being involved in translation activities yes. And what you described sounds a lot like the translation process of the Book of Mormon. What is so fascinating, I don't, does Joseph Smith even know about this stuff? Uh, we talk about the lost 116 pages, Don Bradley's book, and how uh, hiding behind the, uh, uh, hiding uh, kind of like how it's a mini tabernacle going on, even within the translation process by putting up a veil and everything like this, but also having like uh, temple rituals uh in 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 the lost 116 pages uh have you read don bradley's lost 116 pages book i i need to i, ha I haven't gotten okay. to it but so and then there's yeah. another book that i would and, oh it's right here this is actually i i i hard i i really strongly recommend of course i did the, my two-part interview with don bradley that's many people yeah it was great um and uh, this is a great book i also would say jonathan neville and james lucas's book uh the, the urim and thummim uh which has been endorsed by richard bushman himself uh, as as basically saying that the Urim and Thummim were used and not the, the seer stone at all during the uh, translation process, which is a fascinating uh, uh, hypothesis in my mind. But I want to actually throw a hypothesis at you that I threw at Bushman a couple of years ago, and I want to get a Jewish perspective on this, okay? So okay. I'm, I, I'm willing to go with the idea that there was a Urim and Thummim, and they were the spectacles. I'm also willing to engage the idea that there was a seer stone that was also used in the translation process. And how do I, I mesh the two together in this way? Um, so when Moses was up in Sinai, and then he comes down with the tablets, and he sees the Hebrew people, the stuff that they're doing, the sinning and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. He gets angry, and he smashes the, the plates, right? The, 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 the tablets. Yeah. And the thing about the tablets was, in the original version, they were written by the finger of God. Now he goes back up, and God goes to Moses and say, well, now you got to write it with your own hand, right? So now we have a similar scenario in my mind with the translation vis-a-vis -vis the Yerman Thummim, which are pure, oh. pure uh, divine objects, right? But then Joseph Smith sins by allowing Martin Harris to get the lost 116 pages and losing them, right? So yeah. now the plates and the spectacles are taken away from him. Now, at this point, as we are hearing some of the narratives, and again, Jonathan Neville will disagree with me, but I'm saying let's say, let's go with the Searstone narrative at this point. 
Joseph gets back the plates, but he's not given back the Yerman Thummim. And God's going to him just like he went to Moses. Okay, now you got to write with your own hand. Now God's going to Joseph and saying, now you got to use this object, this this less divine object, something that was kind of even used for less divine things, right? Less Christian things. And now you were going to end up with a translation of the Book of Mormon using this object, a second, a, a lesser object. You could have been using the divine instruments, just like I. We, you could have had the tablets written in my finger. And so the, to me, it's a parallel that I think is a stunning one that that I don't think could have been planned. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Wow. Well, I haven't even thought of it. That's thank you for an amazing uh, interpretation. Uh, I mean, Moses was a prophet, right? Yes. And Moses had to deal with uh, his own failure and his people's failure. Moses did not participate in the the worship of the golden calf. Obviously, he was he was up at Mount Sinai, um, but uh, there is a sense that um, the closeness to God has uh, has changed. Um, and you know, so for me, I see Joseph Smith as a prophet. So, uh, you know, if something if if a pattern could happen in Moses's life, I'm open to a pattern occurring in Joseph Smith's life um, that, I mean, the, the translation uh, ended up being what God wanted it to be. I mean, the, the Book of Mormon came forth. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 I don't, I don't think that the Urim and Thummim, if that's a true hypothesis, the Urim and Thummim would have given a, some kind of better translation. Well, well, let's see, I would, I would, I would but, argue that it could have potentially because it was a pure divine object. And then now it's going to be, it's going to be filtered through uh, a, a, what some would consider an object of the occult, of the occult at the time. But I'd also say that you could also make the argument that because um, Moses had to write it in his own hand, perhaps he, he made his, the, 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 that, uh, that it was a lesser, in other words, I think that in one sense, I think that God's grace that we see in the New Testament would have been maybe more uh, obvious in the Ten Commandments, but because Moses is like they don't deserve this, this is going to be more works, and so now it's the, now 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 things are being filtered through ah, Moses, and then we're having yeah. the same thing happening with the Book of Mormon that you could have had a pure, even a better translation, but now you're going to have a lesser translation, and this will be a stumbling block to many people because you use the seer stone. And so it's, it's kind of showing okay. like, okay, so, so, so prophets are, are participants with the divine in this context. And that also that their mistakes can make their way into the text because they are men. And God is saying, Hey, here, here's the pure way. If you want to go my way this way, oh, you chose to go this way. So now, you, now we're going to, it's going to be, it's, it's, it's still divine, but it's going to have, rather than having the, the, uh, the hand of God operating on it, it's also going to have the fingerprints of man on it too. So now you don't have the pure thing. I just kind of like to speculate. Ah, uh, uh, I, I, I do. I, I mean, I think that that is the nature of prophecy, though, is, um, you know, can we as human beings even handle right. literally the direct right. word of God? Could we? And it's always going to be filtered through us anyhow. Right. And maybe these things had to happen. In one sense, just like people say, well, the fall had to happen, right? In order, in other words, the fortunate fall talked about in the Book of Mormon, that maybe that we could show that God's saying, like, look, here, this is where you could be. But because of the state you're in now, this is where this is what you're going to get instead. And, yeah. and, and so I kind of I kind of look at it from that perspective, you know, because again, we're not automatons, especially within the yeah. context of, of the restoration and free agency, that we are participants in this conversation with God. And therefore, it's always inevitably going to be uh, muddied up a little bit. We're going to see through a glass darkly, if you will, because of this of, of the current state that we are at at this time in our in our in our yeah. journey. And so and again, yeah. folks, I'm speaking as an evangelical outsider, I mean, you know, but I, I like to steal man the restoration as best I can. And, and that no, the these are like some great thoughts. Yeah, I I would just say though that I mean, I mean I I've already kind of acknowledged the God's revelation to Moses was a revelation, and God's revelation to Joseph Smith was right. a revelation. And I and yeah, I can acknowledge that there could, could be yeah. I I like see through a glass darkly. I mean that's I think is actually kind of a a subtle reference to Urim and Thummim language there. Um, 
but uh because you know this but we could go into that it's a tangent but uh but i will say that um when i look at the revelation uh from god to moses i i i maybe i i think i look at it a, a little just sli slightly differently i i i always try to frame this and i think it would also apply to my framing of the revelation to joseph smith but I always try to frame it as inner law versus outer law, okay. or not not necessarily that they're even in competition. Inner, I would say inner law and outer law. And 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 this is uh, streams through all the Hebrew prophets, right? And that's that's where um, I think, as Christians in general, writ large, we don't give enough credence to the to the rest of the Hebrew prophets. We like to make it about Moses versus Paul and that's it and we're like Moses versus Paul and then we, and we we have them fight each other but then we forget about all these other Hebrew prophets who also clarified what that revelation at Sinai was all about and so I look at it as um yes there is a sin of the golden calf and there is a kind of a degradation even Jewish tradition says that um for the most part, I mean, there's dis always disagreeing rabbis, <laughs> but that when the, the Jewish people, the, the house of Israel was brought into um, the Sinai experience, they were as angels. They had overcome the fall of Adam and Eve. They were brought into the presence of God. Very similar in the book of Ether, when the brother of Jared, over it, sa it literally says he overcame the fall and he was in the presence of God, even though he's living in mortality so i believe that that and then the golden calf happens and then they you know they lose this angelic state that's part of jewish tradition there's definitely a a lowering you know a, a celestial to terrestrial telestial happening right okay. um but uh but the revelation that moses moses is still pure right he's still receiving everything like he he's oh he's still talking with god as a as a face to face as a man speaketh to his fellow um and so he's there's a there's an inner law happening and an outer law um and if you go through the hebrew prophets right even isaiah they draw near to isaiah 29 they draw near to me with their lips but their hearts are far from me so that the hebrew prophets are trying to get at you know the law is there you got it you got to do the outer law like don't commit adultery don't murder don't steal that's the outer law but right in even jesus comes and he tr continues this tradition he says it you know has been said by them of old time thou shalt not commit adultery but i say unto you do not even lust after a woman in your heart so he's he's continuing that tradition that there's the inner law and it's got to go inside your chest cavity I like to say, and you gotta you gotta observe the law inside, um, and so that prophecy is still flowing from through all the prophets, and I and I think that Joseph Smith is also dealing with that as as God is trying to penetrate these revelations and commandments into the heart and trying to get in, you know, to transform uh, what's going on inside of you as well. So I, I I that's how I see the pattern flowing, and I I think it's. For me, it's consistent, or at least that's how I frame it in my mind. Okay. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. I I, I, I like that we went a little deep in the weeds today. I'm glad that you were able, to, uh, you were receptive to some of my observations and, 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 and got to, I love to have these because look, look, two and a half years ago, folks, I didn't know a single member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I literally have decades of me studying Mormonism and having these questions and say, well, now I get to ask them and I get to, I get to, you know, get, get to have this dialogue. What I find so fascinating is, is how, because I was a total outsider, total, totally isolated from the restoration, all I had was my books and the internet and the library and reading papers online. And, 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 and I'm, I'm kind of trying to bring something to the table, uh, to these conversations as an outsider. So I hope, I hope you enjoyed, enjoyed that. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I, I'm, I'm impressed with your, uh, with your knowledge of, uh, the restoration. And I'm impressed with this book, the burning book. I'm impressed with you as a human being, Jason. I think you're an awesome dude. Um, I it's labor day. 
And as we as we started early on in the conversation, I realized I hadn't had any breakfast. And here we are oh. talking about kosher. And I'm like dying. I'm talking about hamburgers. I'm like, man, I'm really hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry. Oh, no. I don't know if I was going to, but I powered through it. So thank you folks for putting up with that, the, the, being patient, because for a while there, I was like, man, I got to eat something. But, you know, the key thing is we want to also eat. We want to feast on the words of scripture. We want to, we want to, we want to feast on those. And that's the important thing is to be grounded in scripture, have a personal relationship with the savior and also engage people from where they're at. And where Jason is at is he is a member of the church of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Saints. And he is a Jew. And that's how I look at it. And I love you, Jason. I uh, love you, Steve. I, I think you're this an awesome great. human being. I, uh, you let's too. have you back on. I, I think we can continue this conversation some more. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. This is this is lovely. We are, we're certainly uh, soul brothers. Okay, so now, folks, just remember now. I'm I'm in I'm in hearing from a lot of you that a lot of you are buying this book. Okay, so there's going to be a link in the description for those of you who want to buy the burning book. I strongly recommend you get this, and you're also going to send me an extra copy. So maybe one we'll, one of these days yep. we'll also do a book giveaway for it as well. Now, just remember a few things. Don't forget we do have a merch store, MormonBookReviews.com, and you can buy caps and hot chocolate bugs and all these sorts of things. Also, for those of you who'd like to financially support the channel, I have links in the description for Venmo, PayPal, as well as Patreon. And just remember this, folks. Remember, the most important thing is this. All the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.